You're listening to Pod for Israel. For more information, go to oneforisrael.org. Welcome to the third episode of Pod for Israel. And we want to thank you guys for tuning in. We have again with us Dr. Golan Brosh. He's one of our professors here at One for Israel Bible College. And uh, we've been discussing uh, the seven parts of the Rabbinic Reformation. And the last episode was pretty interesting. You talked about uh, turning ethnic Jewishness into a religion, which is uh, was quite an uh, eye-opening subject right there. Today we're going to be going over... The Abolishment of Sacrifices. Yes, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. And again, as we, uh, as we said last, uh, the last time, we were talking about the first, uh, the first revolution, turning uh, the, the Jewish concept from ethnos into a, into a theology. And by doing so, um, the, the rabbis says, said in a different words, they say, it's, my, it's our way or the highway. Uh, if, if you don't abide by our theology... You don't only uh, lose uh, lose access to, to to place to high places in religion. You lose your you can you can lose your Jewishness, and that was the that was the first uh, the first revolutionary uh, act that they did. Um, in other they, words, yeah, it's one thing to lose your religion, and it's another thing to lose your ethnicity, which, as we know, is scientifically impossible, but also culturally wrong as well. Yeah, and you know, even today in modern Israel, the more religious you are. The more people see you as uh, the the more Jewish you get, the more religious you are, and religion I mean I mean in the in the rabbinic sense, the more the more Jewish you appear to be, the more right. the, the, the the longer the beard is, the longer the the, the more relig- rabbinic religious a guy is, the more he would be perceived as, as his Jewishness would be higher, uh, as as if there's a correlation between the two. Yes. Yeah, and again, you know, this is like. Uh, you were saying earlier, it's a this this is a family discussion. This is uh you know as we discuss these things, it's important to understand that love is the thing that really guides us. Love is the reason why we even talk about this because our brothers and sisters are in darkness, and we want to pray for them. We want to and and part of this is you know for for the Gentiles and the nations. You know how can you pray for Israel? How can you pray for the people here in an educated way? And part of it is understanding this is kind of the fight. This is part of the the battle that we're we're in. Is uh, and again, it's not against flesh and blood. You know, we love our Orthodox brothers. We love the rabbis. We pray for them daily, um, and we're asking for God to open their eyes. And eyes are being opened even today. Praise the Lord. Uh, we get we we get testimonies all the time, people texting us and messaging us that they've come out of this and their eyes have been opened to to some of these distortions of the truth. And so we need to continue to keep that in mind as we're studying through this series, especially if you love your family member, you're going to tell them the truth. Amen. If you love them, you're going to uh, pray for them and be truthful with them. You're not going to just kind of, oh, bless you. It's a family brother. dispute. It's yeah. a family discussion. And we're having, we're having this discussion, Jews with, with our fellow Jews. It has nothing to do with, uh, with them against us, with hatred. With, it's only out of the love for the truth. And again, it's a family dispute. Jews with other Jews discuss, discussing uh, true authority, true, true biblical Judaism, just discussing uh, what the truth is. And I, and I think a second point to bring up besides, you know, keeping the mindset of love and uh, that this is a loving family dispute is also there's a lot of parallels with the sins of the fathers and the sins of today, the stumbling blocks that we can even find ourselves in that uh, we've seen in the history of Christianity, actually, uh, falling into the same sort of patterns of control, patterns of distortion, and things like that. And we, as we study this, I think we should be asking ourselves as Christians and, and, you know, Gentiles and Jews alike, you know, how do I see these problems? How do I see these kind of the, the sins of the fathers? How do I, how do I see these sort of patterns in me, in me yes. maybe in religion, maybe, maybe in what our church say, today? What we say about rabbinic Judaism can be true of most any religion, any established religion. As you said, and uh, the, 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 the danger is turning the faith, the, the, the real Jewish faith in Messiah Yeshua, 
into a systematic religion, into an establishment religion that would fall into the same follies, the same sins of every other religion. Right on. Yeah. So let's get into it. It is 70 AD and some stuff is going down. Yes, some heavy stuff went down. Um, the, the, thir- the first thing was the temple. The temple went down between 67 and 70 AD. And when the temple was down, when the temple was destroyed, again, Judaism, is, as everybody knew it, ab- was abolished. Biblical Judaism was destroyed. And on the destruction of this temple, something new had to come. And the, uh, the, the, the Midrash... The Midrash is taking note of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, and I think it's, um, let's see, it's ben Zakkai and Rabbi Yeshua. They left, the, the, they were going on the, they were going about, and they saw Jerusalem destruction. And, and, and Rabbi Joshua is asking uh, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, what are we going to do now when we don't have sacrifices anymore? Rabbi, Rabbi Joshua raised the important question. He, they saw the destruction of the temple with their own eyes. And Rabbi Joshua in the Midrash, it's called Midrash Avot de Rabbi Natan, in chapter 4, he's asking his, his rabbi, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, what are we going to do now that the temple is destroyed? Right. Judaism as we know it, the world as we know it, was destroyed. What are we going to do now for our sins? What is, who is going to atone for us? Right. And the answer of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the answer was brilliant, was mind-blowing, was revolutionary in every sense. You know what he told him? We have a new atonement now. We have hmm. a new atonement, and I can quote the Hebrew, but I'm trying to, um, to translate as we talk. We have a different kapara, we have a different atone- atonement. What is it? And he says, this is gmilut chasadim, righteous deeds. Righteous deeds. And what is righteous deeds? This is helping the poor. This is prayer. This is all the, 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 um, the, the acts of religion that we can come up with. But we don't need, we're not dependent on the, sacrifi- the th- sacrificial system in the temple anymore. We have a righteous deed. We have, we have new laws instead of the, of the practice of, uh, of 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 uh, sacrifices in the in the temple, he says praying three times a day, for instance, praying three times a day substitutes for uh, sacrifice for the sacrifices in the temple. So did it stop there? Is that uh, is that all you need to do to have atonement? So I'll give you another I'll give you another uh, another example from uh, and this is uh, straight from the Talmud from uh, tractate Megillah. It's called Megillah and it's thirty one B. And they they do a midrash from Genesis 15, and they say that Abraham has to has to um, has to make a sacrifice, and they're doing a midrash over it, and they say now, when there's no longer a temple, it's enough to read the portion of, of the Torah that has to do with sacrifices, instead of doing the sacrifices themselves. Yeah. So instead of the, the the actual act of the priests in the temple. If you read about the sacrifices in the Torah, if you read about the priests handling the sac- this is enough. That's a substitution. Right. You got to read instead of doing the actual thing. And it, be- because we don't have a temple anymore, by reading the the, the portions of uh, the deals with sacrifices in the Torah, in the it, it could be in the in the book of Leviticus, your substitute. It's it's a valid substitution for sacrifices reading putting hmm. putting words instead of instead of deeds instead of the the actual sacrifice system but this is an amazing revolution amazing so and you would almost look at first of all you know there's the destruction of the temple and it was no more but the problem started way before then the problem has actually started after the resurrection of yeshua there were some big disruptions happening You're, you're pushing me into saying provocative things. I know you. You're pushing me into saying it. And, and, and you know, I'm going to quote the scholars. Because yeah. the scholars, you're right. The scholars are not stopping there. Some scholars are saying, because there was such a big fight among Jewish sects, that the biggest fight was, was between the, the priests, the 
Sadducees, you call them, the, the priests, and the Pharisees, the, 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 the rabbis. Which that's well documented in the scriptures. Now, the problem the scriptures. is, the problem is, as long as the temple was standing, the priest controlled the Jewish world. As long as they had the temple, they had the control. So what do you do? What do you wish for if you're from the opposition party? If you know that everything is pinned on the temple, what are you going to wish for hmm. in order to take control over the Jewish world? Now, this is not your words. This is, this is not my words. I'm, I'm, I can quote, um, let's say, for instance, for instance, um, Okay, I can quote Dr. Isaac, uh, Dr. Isaac Azuz, or uh, or or other other scholars that that actually say that their hints, their historical hints, that the Pharisees um, invited the Romans, invited the Romans on purpose to destroy the temple, to destroy the second temple. Now you could say because the priests there were were corrupted because the, the, there are many reasons. Now these but scholars, what's their background? Secular or religious scholars, you know. Some of them are from Bambariland University, which is a, okay. uh, and we can make their books available like university. we like we did before. We can make the okay. books available. It's not it's not uh, something we say. Some scholars uh, find historical hints f f th that imply that the Pharisees. The, the, in, in other words, the destruction of the temple wasn't um, wasn't an accident, or it, it, it was it was an order. It was a it, it was a wishful thinking that came true. It was a, you, you, you know when Ben when Yohanan Ben Zakai told the Spasianus, leave Yavne, take Jerusalem, but leave Yavne and, and 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 the scholars in Yavne, give me Yavne, take Jerusalem, but give me Yavne. It it wasn't only a prophecy. Some scholars say it was a wishful thinking hmm. of Yohanan Ben Zakai said in order to establish the, 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 the new Judaism we have in mind, in order to, to get rid of the, of, of, of the opposition, the priests, we need to get rid of the temple. Right. And indeed, the Romans came and took the temple and destroyed the temple in the, in the year 70. And there came about the new, uh, the, the new rabbinic religion which doesn't need any more, doesn't need the, the sacrifice system anymore. It has substitution. Right. This is why I call the, um, the rabbinic religion, I call, it the, uh, I call it the new covenant of the oral law. Because now we're not, we're not dependent on the covenant of, of sacrifices, right. on the covenant of Sinai. We're, we're, we're dependent on the new covenant, of the, co the, the covenant of the oral law. And this, and this battle that you're describing is actually between... Really, the like as you said, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees at the time were kind of the politically connected uh, elite, as you read in the scriptures and Acts and in the Gospels as well. You kind of see them battling it out, where uh, the Pharisees were actually, in some ways, had a lot of stuff right. They had the resurrection correct, and they had some of these things, but um, but then kind of were going a different direction in a lot of ways. <laughs> Uh, than the Sadducees, and so you're saying that that basically there is a theory, and it's a theory that Israeli scholars, religious and secular, are saying that there could have been a political motivation to to create this event, which some people could could say would would ha would have happened one way or another. So e e at, at minimum, you could say they wanted to capitalize on that because they saw that. This coming and wanted to make that revolution happen. Any way you slice it, it was the, a, a big leverage for rabbinic Jerusalem to rise up when there's no longer a temple, when mm. the priests are left jobless. Right. There's the, there's there's the opportunity. Right. Yeah? There now, and 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 the, if if this is not enough, there was another Jewish movement that says that claimed that it has a, a substitute for, for, for sacrifice, that you don't need sacrifices anymore. There was another rivalry Jewish movement alongside the rabbinic movement that says there's no need for sacrifices anymore. And that was the messianic, uh, messianic movement. Right. The Jesus movement, the Yeshua movement, Rabbi Yeshua. 
They said that we don't need sacrifices anymore. We have a sacrifice. So here's here, here's really what happened because, like what we discussed before in the previous episode, the supernatural departed from the temple. God stopped accepting the sacrifice. This is documented in, in the, the rabbinic text in the Talmud. They talk about how you know that thread that they would tie around the neck uh, that would turn from red, scarlet to white mm-hmm. when God would accept that uh, sacrifice, uh, and as a scapegoat was sent out. Mm-hmm. So that's documented by their own people saying, hey, it stopped. And the time it stopped was right after Yeshua. So either God left our people in the lurch to figure it out ourselves, which that doesn't sound like God's character, or he created the way, the truth, and the life. He created the next way forward and made a way for them. So yeah. it's, it's interesting also to think about there was one other time when the temple was destroyed. It was during the judgment that God sent upon Jerusalem. And you can look at, did Daniel follow an oral Torah? Was there any evidence of the oral Torah during that time, during the first exile? No, the rabbinic stack. The oral law would say that Daniel prayed three times. We know that Daniel prayed three times a day towards Jerusalem. But that they was actually say, in the Torah. They would say he followed the oral law. Look, he's praying three times right. a day. But, but we have in the in, in the Psalms we have David praying seven times a day, and mm. it says when Daniel prayed, he was knee, he, he was kneeling on his knees and raising his hands up. You know, we don't right. we don't see we don't see any any Orthodox Jews pray like this in the synagogue. So even if Daniel uh, prayed three times a day towards Jerusalem. He didn't do it in the Orthodox Jewish way that they do it today because he didn't pray. He, he prayed on his knees, lifting, mm. lifting his hands up. And we know that when Solomon dedicated the temple, when Solomon prayed, he said, if, 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 uh, if, if your people leave Israel and they pray to this house, I will hear them. And this is exactly what Daniel did in the diaspora. When he wasn't in Israel, he was praying towards the house, towards the temple. Mm-hmm. He was praying to Jerusalem, like the, like the Bible says he should. So basically, so, during the exile, to summarize, the command that was given through the Torah, through the prophets, through Solomon, was when you're in exile, if the temple's destroyed, what do you do? You pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for the return and the rebuilding of the temple again, pray that God would have mercy and bring you back again. And so what changed was, in a way, did they kind of give up on that prayer? Did they kind of give up now on that the command? prayer substitutes now, today, from 2,000 years ago until today, the, the prayer substitutes the, 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 the sacrifice system in the temple. Right. And, and, and because we have a few seconds left to this, to this episode, I just want to tell you. So again, we have two movements uh, in in the in the first century, two mo- movements are coming. The messianic movement, which which says that now everything is dependent on Yeshua. Right. He's the true sacrifices. He's the he's the he's the true atonement. Right. Yeshua, the Messiah, and we have we have alongside raising up the the, the rabbinic movement, which says that everything is has to do with the Talmidei Chachamim, Talmidei Chachamim, the, the the wise disciples, the study in the in yeshiva, they are the atonement for Israel. You know what? I know we're over time, but I'm going to ask you one last thing. And this is the crucial linchpin to me. Yes, sir. The atonement we have in Yeshua is absolute. Amen. By faith, we're saved through his perfect, perfect sacrifice. But compare that with the assurance of atonement that you have from Judaism. Is there any assurance that you've studied enough, that you've prayed enough, that you've said enough, that you've done enough mitzvot? Like... Is there any completion or assurance at all? And you wouldn't believe it, because in the Talmud, when Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the pillars, one of the pillars, the, the most important pillar of rabbinic Judaism, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, was on his, on, on his deathbed. His, student, his students came to, to, to say goodbye to him before he dies, and he was crying. And they said, Rabbi, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And he, says, he said to them, I see two doors. I see in front of me two doors, one to heaven, one to hell. And I don't know. I, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, the most righteous rabbi in the world. I do not know where I'm going. On my oh. deathbed, I, do not, I'm, I don't have any assurance if I'm going to heaven 
or the hell. And this is in the Talmud. So now listen, if Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai didn't have the, this insurance, if he wasn't sure, what about other Jewish people yeah, that are less than him? Sounds pretty hopeless. <laughs> yes. So again, it's, it's, if, if, you know, if we don't have the assurance, the, 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 the assurance of Yeshua as our, as our, as our atonement, All right. We're lost, and there's a there's a big difference between the sacrifice. I mean, it talks about the sacrifice of our lips as we pray to God, and so there's we could say uh, sacrifice. Uh, we also, you know, do good works to to our brothers, not for salvation's sake, but because of what because Yeshua love the did Lord. for us. Yeah. Because we love our neighbor and we love God according to His command. But that's the key thing: atonement. Even though they said sacrifice, but atonement. Never came into the picture. Actual true atonement was left out, and so I think that's really important to actually kind of close in on that and say this is a good prayer point because if you think about it, think about Rabbi Yochanan and and that cry as he was going to meet his maker, and let that guide your intercession, let that guide your prayer time because what what hopelessness, I guess, and what what. And before we end, I just I just want to leave the audience with again. Remember, so the the temple is destruct is destructed is is gone. Destruct, we have yeah. we have two New Testaments. We have a New Testament that is dependent on the Messiah, and we have a New Testament, an oral law testament, a rabbinic New Testament that is dependent on wise disciples and the rabbis themselves, and we have a witness from the Talmud that even the the chief rabbi himself, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, wasn't sure. Where he's headed when he when he left this world? Hmm. So, so which new covenant? Which new covenant is is more reliable? Well, that's the question. And and that's uh, what we, that's where we are. That's what we investigate. That's what we do. That's our passion to find the truth. Which hmm. new covenant is more tr- tr- trustworthy? The, the 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 Messiah new covenant or the Rabbi's new covenant? Because there must there there had to be a new covenant after the destruction of the temple. The, the uh, biblical oh. Judaism, Judaism, Judaism was gone. Yeah, there had to come a New Testament hmm. of, of of some kind. Which is it? Right. Well, thank you, Doctor Golan. I really appreciate it, and I'm excited for our next episode about the abolishment of the three branches of government. Uh, oh, yeah, sounds like a big one. All right, God bless. See you next week. <laughs>